Hi. It's a, it's a great pleasure for me to be here. Thank you so much for having me, and thanks to the organizers for the invitation. The question that I'm going to start out with today is why you should care about the psychology, let alone the neuroscience, that underlies uncertainty and trust. I mean, we're at a point in time where very few people are actually going to buy stocks from buystocksforthus.com. They may not be able to explain exactly why they know not to click on this site, but at this point, the fact that they're not going to is really all we care about. Unfortunately, not everything's so straightforward. So imagine that someone's trying to go to CNN.com, and the browser throws up this warning. Now, it says, your connection is not private. That's a little ambiguous for the average person. What does not private specifically mean? It's my computer, and I'm at home. And in addition, attackers might be trying to steal your information, including personal information and credit card. This is terrifying. It's also unclear to the average person what exactly this means. I just want to read a news article or follow this link from Twitter. I'm not going to give my credit card information, so I'm totally safe, right? Is there other stuff I don't know? What else should I know? And it's critical to understand how people make decisions at this stage because how they respond this time to CNN.com is how they're going to respond to your message every single other time they get to it. And so at this point, it raises the question of what factors are or are not influencing people to go on to the next page or to take their next action. Now, in this situation, nobody's given, necessarily giving their credit card information. But in a lot of the situations that I study where people are buying things online, you are being asked to give your credit card information. So if I'm going to make a purchase, this is actually a fairly credible looking site. But I'm in the US, and I don't know what the New Zealand Post account means, if you see that checkbox over there. Totally irrelevant to whether or not I should be buying from this site. And yet, because I don't know what it means, now this added piece of information can actually also create uncertainty, because I no longer completely understand what's going on when I decide to give away my credit card information. And it's not just now that I'm giving it away. I'm actually being asked whether or not I want to give it away in perpetuity. It's a totally weird question. I don't hand a copy of my credit card to the checkout at the grocery store in case I might stop by for milk to make things faster the next time. So we're asking people to make decisions online that don't really necessarily have obvious analogs in their everyday and offline life. And at this point, it becomes at least useful to understand a little bit more about the general parameters of decision making, the kinds of information people use, what makes them feel more safe, what makes them feel more unsafe. And in particular, when we think about designing these kinds of interfaces and the kinds of messages that we're sending people, not only how can we help them make more secure decisions, but how can we help them feel confident about these choices so that they can then approach them with some security going forward internally as well as externally. And this is, uh, again, as I mentioned, the first time that you interact with one of these situations sets the precedent for how you interact later. We know in marketing, insurance is an incredibly difficult thing to sell because you're protecting against something that hasn't happened to you. If I go to a dangerous place or if I take an, an action that isn't particularly helpful for me and I don't have any negative immediate consequence, my threshold for doing it again is much lower the next time. Nothing bad happened to me, nothing bad happened to my friends, nothing bad's going to happen. So let me start by telling you what the brain can tell us about the mechanisms that drive behavior related to trust and uncertainty. It turns out the easiest way to measure this is just to ask people. Ask people to think about trust. So in this experiment, the researchers asked people to evaluate photographs of Caucasian males between the ages of 18 and 35. And they were either asked to tell people or to make the decision about whether these people were at the college or high school level, or whether these people were trustworthy or untrustworthy. What they were doing this decision-making task in a functional magnetic resonance imaging trial, or a, a, an fMRI scanner. fMRI is a non-invasive brain scanning technique. Um, it's not perfect. It uh, doesn't tell us everything about what the brain's doing, but it can give us some idea of the neural activity that correlates with a particular thought process or task. And as such, it can give us some insights about what's going on in the brain when people are doing things like thinking about whether someone else is trustworthy. 
So is there a particular brain area that correlates with trust? Sort of. So this is the superior temporal sulcus, and this is the brain area that they saw was more active during the trust task than during the school task. And if I turned my head sideways and sliced it this way, the superior temporal sulcus would be right about above my ear here. There's another view of it too, what we call a coronal view, if I had sliced the front of my face off. Sorry to get gruesome in the morning. And it would be sort of right behind here. So if you see here, the, again, the, the graph on the right shows that activity is higher in the trust task than the school task, but it's not exactly coding for trustworthiness. It's coding for a judgment that relates to trust, but there isn't more activity the more you trust someone. So is there a brain area that codes for trust? Probably not. It's, uh, there are multiple brain areas. It turns out that trust is an incredibly complex construct. So it involves uh, interpersonal decision making, theory of mind, self-referential effects, learning over time, retrieval of memories of prior interaction. There are lots of different brain areas. It turns out we don't, at least uh, to the best of my knowledge at this point, have one central brain area that's uh, con coding for trust in a unidimensional manner. What's interesting, though, is that they did find a very well-described network of brain areas that coded for distrust. So the more activity they saw in the amygdala, the more people distrusted someone else. This is interesting because in later studies, other researchers like Ralph Adolphs have studied people who have lesions in the amygdala or damage to that part of their brain. And those people are far more willing to trust total strangers. So the more activity you have in this brain area, the more you distrust someone. When you're missing this brain area, you lose the ability to distrust. And in fact, in recent research by Angelica DeMocha and colleagues, there's more activity in this brain area the more you distrust an online seller. So it doesn't have to be someone you're immediately face to face with. Now in these studies, we're looking at essentially an interpersonal judgment, me and you and how we're going to interact, and there's a target or a target entity or a target person. We can also ask how people respond just to uncertainty, uncertain situations where there's not an obvious target. And when we ask people to think about uncertainty, economic theory offers us some structure on how we can do it. So one kind of uncertainty is risk, and this is a kind of gamble that you guys are probably all familiar with. Let's say I have 100 poker chips in a bag. 50 of them are red, 50 of them are blue, and I'm gonna draw a poker chip from the bag, and if I draw a red one, you win. You don't know exactly what the outcome's gonna be, but most of you in this room are probably pretty comfortable with judging how much that gamble is worth it to you. In fact, it's pretty easy to calculate what we would call subjective utility. That is, you have 50-50 odds on $50, it's worth about 25 bucks. Now, there's a second layer of uncertainty that's probably more reflective of the way that we interact in the online world, and we call that ambiguity. And what ambiguity is, is you don't know the probabilities and you don't know the outcomes. So basically, your information is incomplete or partial. And it turns out people hate this. In fact, we have a term for it in the academic literature, it's called ambiguity aversion. You don't like heading into a situation where not only do you not know if it's gonna be a good one for you, but you also don't really have a handle on how risky or how difficult it is. So is there a brain area that handles or seems to represent the degree to which you see something is ambiguous? Is there some brain area that codes for ambiguity aversion, this unpleasantness of being ignorant beyond risk? There is, and it's called the amygdala. So there's a, uh, this, in this work, they found that there was significantly more activity in the amygdala, which is represented by those blue lines on the graph, for when you were seeing uncertain or ambiguous gambles compared to when you saw risky ones. Now, I've drawn a clear parallel between distrust and response to uncertainty. Just because the same brain area codes for something does not mean it's the same thing. There are tons of neurons in the amygdala. They have, are uh, in tons of circuits that do several different functions. But it does suggest that we should be thinking about the parallels here. And it also tells us that there are unipolar representations of distrust and uncertainty in the brain. And maybe that's a better target for understanding how people are behaving. In fact, uh, maybe that can tell us a little bit more about how and when people decide to enter their personal information or commit financial resources, dependent on how we shift around their distrust or uncertainty. 
Turns out that's a really good reason for me to be here. I have a terrible secret to tell you all. I am not a cybersecurity expert. <laughs> but I am, uh, I do know a little bit about how people make decisions, particularly under uncertainty and the way that they use information. So let me tell you about what kind of information helps us make decisions under uncertainty. Let's go back to that paper bag. Ooh, I don't know what just happened there. That's very exciting. Um, you can all put on your 3D glass. No. <laughs> so imagine a um, paper bag with 100 chips. All of them are red or blue. But you don't know how many are red and how many are blue. And I should say, by the way, this is a, a toy task we designed to get at this information. I designed it with Alex Pesakovich. At the time, he was an econ PhD student. Now he's a hotshot data scientist at Facebook. Um, so Alex and I told people, you have 100 chips in a bag. They're all either red or blue. There's no green or yellow popping out anywhere. I'm going to draw one from the bag. And if I draw a red one, you win 50 bucks. The more red chips you have in this situation, the more favorable information you have. The more blue chips you have, the more unfavorable information you have. So I can vary the amount of information I give you, and I can vary how uncertain you are or how much ignorance you have. I can tell you there are at least 25 red chips and at least 50 red chips. Now, your gamble looks like 50-50, except that you know that there are 50 chips whose colors you're not aware of. How do people use the red and blue information? Are they biased? Do they prefer one kind over the other? And to get to this, we asked people, how much are you willing to pay to play this gamble out, depending on how much information we gave you? And what we found is that people show profound optimism biases. The favorable information seems to be massively overweighted compared to the unfavorable information in calculating how much money they're willing to pay to go in this lottery. Why is this happening? Are people just not calculating risk very well? Are they not very bright? So we asked a couple of other questions. We asked, um, what do you think the probability of getting a red versus a blue chip is? Essentially, what do you think your probability of winning is? Maybe, maybe people are just calculating that in a funny way. And we also asked them what turns out to be the critical question, how certain do you feel that you understand the probabilities? How confident are you in your judgment of the probabilities? Not how confident are you that you're, that you're gonna win, but how much do you feel like you've got this decision? So it turns out people are not being stupid. They're adjusting their probabilities accurately based on the information that you got. More favorable information makes you believe that you're more likely to win, and more unfavorable information makes you believe that you're more likely to lose. However, both kinds of information increase your certainty. So favorable information has two positive pathways. Unfavorable information has one positive, one negative. To some extent, it's canceling itself out. And notice here that this is a situation where more information objectively makes you more informed. Whether it's favorable or unfavorable, the more I tell you, the smaller that gray part of the bar shrinks. What this suggests is that information has some rewarding benefit to you. you like having more information, and that actually translates into shifting the way that you use it overall, or biasing your outcome of your decision. And in fact, when we look at neural data, we also find that if you just look at the total amount of information, forget if it's favorable or unfavorable, you see significant activity in reward-related circuits. Finding out more stuff, it's not just that you don't like uncertainty, it's explicitly rewarding, it's maybe relieving to be less ignorant and to be more certain. So how does this translate into committing money, right? From my, uh, from my perspective, that's literally the outcome that we care the most about in the marketplace. The more likely you think you are to win the gamble, the more you're willing to pay for a ticket to the gamble. Anyone in this room could have predicted that. The more certain you are that you've estimated the probabilities right, even if they're not the greatest probabilities, the more you're willing to pay for a gamble. People like feeling certain, and it's got a measurable financial impact. It's far more persuasive when people are certain compared to uncertain. I cannot underweight the importance of being certain here. So if information makes you feel less certain, so I raise the possibility of a situation or an attacker or a kind of information that you might be losing that you hadn't thought of before, all of those signs flip around. If positive, and even if information's positive for you, if it makes you feel less certain, it changes the directions of your biases. It actually causes people to withdraw. The more certain you are, the more likely you are to act on your beliefs and preferences. The more likely you are to take an action and a decision, and the more likely you are to remember it going forward.
In fact, we've actually found that people are so desiring of being certain when they're uncertain, so feeling uncertain is so aversive that if I just tell you to be certain, I can communicate certainty itself as information. So my certainty can make you feel more certain, and that can make you value a product more. It can make you more willing to make a decision as well. It can make you more persuaded by whatever I'm saying. I definitely think that you should absolutely go to the restaurant across the street from dinner. Far more persuasive than simply, I'm pretty sure you should go to the restaurant across the street from dinner. It's good. It amplifies the weight of what's going on. So to summarize, in the cybersecurity community, the conversations that I have as a psychologist often revolve around trust. One of the things that we've learned from the brain data is that maybe the focus could be on uncertainty. That is, it's not about you. It's about them, your users. How do they feel? How uncertain are they feeling? Not how much do they trust you, but how much risk are they perceiving here, and how comfortable or uncomfortable are they about making these judgments? Secondly, favorable and unfavorable information has value for people who feel uninformed or ignorant. If you feel uncertain, anything that fixes that has explicit value and can influence the value that you place on a particular outcome. And finally, how certain people feel is a critical factor in determining who they listen to and how they act. So for example, informative can actually be more persuasive than information. Again, we've run an experiment where we tell people that they, had a, or that they have the opportunity to go to a seven course meal at a restaurant. And then we say, at least two of the dishes are ones that you love, and at least two of the dishes might be ones that you have a lesser preference for. That sounds like they're getting more information. But it turns out that saying at least two of the dishes are X or Y reminds them that they don't know exactly what they're going to be getting in the tasting menu. And so adding more information actually makes them feel more ignorant and causes people to not want the dinner at all. So the critical element here is not just providing facts that uh, cover the scope of what your users are facing, but that make them feel like they understand the problem and that it's relevant to them. Tailoring is a hard thing to do, believe me, uh, marketers know this too, but it turns out to be a critical factor in how much people are actually paying attention to the messaging that you're giving them. Um, turns out I'm a little bit early, but thank you for listening. Uh, let's talk. <laughs>